So good morning, everybody. You sleep well? Nice sleep? OK. And uh, this lecture is about calderas, OK? So we are going to see the structure, the evolution, and the arrest, as well as the magma transfer processes within calderas. So I will just start with a quite provocative slide. This is a Google Earth view of the Napolitan area. And you see this dark spot here? You know what is it? It's Vesuvio, right? And you know Vesuvio is famous for its, uh, mostly famous for its Pompeii eruption 2,000 years ago. And uh, Pompeii is somewhere here. Of course, Pompeii was there 2,000 years ago, and uh, today there is no Pompeii. But we have Naples today, which is on the opposite side of the volcano. And of course, there is a significant treat on the town by, by the volcano. So I would just uh, like to show you a very down-to-earth hazard analysis considering the hazard of the impact, the possible impact of Vesuvio on Naples. First, you have to think that Vesuvio is downwind with regard to Naples. So all the products will fall to the east, very likely. Then if you look at the most destructive eruptions, they are in the order of one cubic kilometer. Thanks a lot. So, and then you see that the volcano, since 1944, it has been quiescent. So no degassing, no seismicity, no surface deformation. On the other end, on the other side of Naples, to the west, we have this volcanic field. And this is Campi Feglere Caldera. So it's a caldera. It doesn't have any prominent topographic feature. In fact, it's very dis dis difficult to distinguish that it's a large volcano. And indeed, if you go here in the middle of the caldera, the people will ask you whether they are safe from Vesuvio. <laughs> no, it's true. So you have to consider also that, uh, OK. The caldera is up with, with, with regard to Naples. So the products will most likely fall on Naples. And then the most destructive eruptions were larger than 100 cubic kilometers. And then finally, on top of this, the caldera has been restless in the last uh, 70 years, 60 years. So this is just to say that uh, we should pay a lot of attention when we deal with volcanoes. There are some volcanoes which are really not so evident, as we may expect. But indeed, they are very, very dangerous. So the message is that uh, these are large, long-lived, and restless magmatic systems, which are systematically responsible for the most destructive eruptions on Earth. So I guess that this is a, poses an additional care when we study volcanoes, because uh, these systems are very delicate to, to handle, I would say. So caldera is defined as a subcircular depression with a diameter which is usually larger than that of a crater. And the most important part is that it involves some removal of magma from the reservoir. This may occur through an eruption, or also in many cases through the lateral intrusion of magma at depth. And of course, which is the most distinctive feature of a caldera? A feature you will be able to recognize very easily is the topographic rim. Okay, which is a morphological feature because this lies well outside the structural rim where the ring fault is. And the ring fault is responsible for the subsidence of the central part of the caldera. So what we usually see is just the erosional part of this ring fault. And then the ring fault is usually buried, hidden. And you may be able to recognize it, if you're lucky, if there is some vent just above it because the magma is intruded the ring fault. Then inside the caldera, many times you may have uh, an uplifted area, even of one kilometer over long time scales, in the order of uh, several thousands of years. And this is a resurgence. So this resurgence exposes the intra caldera ignimbrite as well as any sedimentary deposit within. So this is the established classification of caldera which has been proposed. And this is based on mainly on field evidence. And these are five types, five end members, I would say, uh, of geometrical features of calderas. I don't know how much you know about this, but this is a very simple type. It's called the piston because it's a coherent block which is subsiding. This is a piecemeal where you have different blocks which are collapsing. The trapdoor is an asymmetric structure with some flexure on one side. And the ring fault, well, actually, this is not a ring fault, a fault, because it's not uh, all around the caldera, a fault on the other side. The downseg is a, well, less pronounced caldera. It is uh, 
it is characterized by a broad flexure at the surface. And then we have a funnel, which is a very narrow and deep caldera. So just look at these five types of calderas here and think which may be the most suitable to explain, for example, this caldera here, which is not far from here, is in central Italy, Bolsena. This is the map view and this is the section view. So which types of caldera would you, would you think may fit with this, uh, with this uh, structure? Eh? Well, okay. I think there is plenty, actually. Trapdoor, yeah, it's a possibility, but uh, of course, this structure looks like a piston. Okay, so the central part may resemble a piston. On this side, here, we have a downseg, so we also have some downseg component. On the other side here, which is here and here, we have uh, lots of faulting, so it may be a piecemeal, but yeah, maybe the overall structure is a trapdoor. So if you want, you may call this uh, a piston-like caldera with a downsegged rim, a piecemeal rim, and an overall trapdoor structure, which is too complicated for me. So you see, in this case, we are not really able to, to uh, explain the structure of this caldera just using these five, these simple five geometric types. And this is not just uh, because this caldera is difficult to, to be understood. There are many calderas which are like this. Actually. Possibly most of the calderas share this complexity. And then there is another problem, which is about ring folds, the nature of the ring folds. Uh, Cindy was talking about TABO in New Zealand. This is a, well, a very simplified structure of TABO from gravimetric data in map view and in section view. And you see that the caldera here is bordered by these inward dipping folds. These are thought to be normal folds because of the displacement. And we have a similar uh, stuff here also in bias. If you see the subsurface structure, all the, these folds here are inward dipping normal folds. And of course, nobody has ever been there at depth to see that those are normal folds. I guess in most of the cases, we were able to think that these are normal folds because here you have a drill or you have this layer which is here. In another drill or the layer is up here, so you just put some normal fold in between. And you know why? Because this, uh, I think this is a, something which volcanologists have been uh, relying on a, lo a lot in the past. Because the idea is that if you have magma, if you have a volcano, you must have magma. So you must accommodate the magma in the crust. So you need extension to accommodate the magma in the crust. So if you need extension, the normal fault is the best candidate to have this extension. But of course, there is a, a room problem, a space problem here. Do you know it? For example, look here. If you want to collapse the central block, if this has to go down, what happens? You must extend to the sides. Otherwise, this will not go down. And of course, this depends on the deep of the folds. But if you have a collapse in the order of 1,000 meters, maybe this is as deep as 2,000 meters, then you need to have a few hundreds of meters of extension. And if the collapse occurs in one day, two days, as it's usual, then you need to extend the crust of hundreds of meters in days, which is completely unrealistic. So you have this important space problem with these inward dipping normal folds. Some people have been wiser, and so they were drawing the folds in a subvertical geometry. So this doesn't make any problem with the, with the space problem, which is, of course, feasible. And other people have been more provocative. They were drawing the ring folds like this, outward dipping. And these outward dipping ring folds imply which type, of, which type of kinematics. If this is the outward dipping and this goes down, it's an apparently reverse kinematics. And many volcanology are, uh, volcanologists are uh, quite scared about this reverse component because they, they think that there is some compression. So this means that their magma cannot make it to the surface. So many people really do not accept so much this model. So at this point, I hope you are sufficiently confused to ask yourself the same questions which are here. The first is, uh, how can we use this uh, established caldera classification to interpret the structure and the evolution of calderas? And the second is, uh, which is the nature of the ring folds bordering the caldera? And in particular, how can we solve the room problem? So we go 
sorry, we go to the first part of the talk, which is concerned about the structure and the evolution of calderas. You know what is this picture? This is a, an aerial view of Miyakejima, caldera in Japan, which collapsed in 2000. And you can clearly recognize an innermost ring fault here and an outermost ring fault. We will see this with more detail in a, in a few slides. So the first thing I did to try to understand something about uh, the structure and the evolution of calderas is, of course, to go to the field. I tried to go to, go to, the, to some nice, well-exposed calderas, not so much like Campi Flegre, where there is a lot of seed, there is a lot of post-caldera activity, a lot of people, a lot of buildings. So if you go to these very peaceful places, you may try to understand something about the structure of calderas. But even actually, in the best conditions, like this caldera here, where there's no vegetation, no people, and the caldera is active, there are two lava lakes. Well, actually, now there's one lava lake here, but a few, few tens of years ago, there was another lava lake here. So it's a very active caldera. Even in these very favorable conditions, you can just appreciate the shallow morphology, not even structure of the caldera. And you cannot say anything about the deep structure. And so you have a sense of frustration if you want to really understand how calderas work on the field. So I try to use analog models. You know, they are very simple and, uh, yeah, they're very, very simple. It's, good. it's a good tool. And you can really understand the processes behind with these type of models. So I started to make these models. This was a long time ago. And the funny thing is that at the same time, many other people were doing the same models. And uh, we didn't know about each other. And then when we compared our models, we saw that all the results were very much consistent. And this was independently of any boundary conditions. We had different materials, different apparatuses, different uh, boundary conditions. Everything was different, but the results were very much consistent. And I guess this is a, a very strong point, because if you have different boundary conditions in your model, and all the results are the same, it means that maybe there is some, uh, something you should think about. Maybe the models are, the models are not so funny as they, they might seem. And so I'm going to summarize here the structure and the evolution of all these models. And this is just depending on the amount of subsidence. So at the beginning, if we have a very low amount of subsidence, we develop a downseg at the surface. And this is stage one. And the downseg results from the upward propagation of these ring folds, which are still buried at depth. Sorry. When the ring folds reach the surface, we have a scarp. And this scarp is the result of an outward dipping reverse fault. So those people were right, in, maybe they were right in pointing out these outward dipping reverse faults. And uh, stage three then, if we further increase the subsidence, we develop an outer, a peripheral downseg, which is related to the upward propagation of these uh, peripheral faults. And when these reach the surface, sorry, I have some problem with the, OK, when these reach the surface, we develop an outer scarp so that we have two concentric ring faults. And the outermost here is an inward dipping normal fault. So while the innermost ring fault is actually we will see is the mechanical explanation for the formation of calderas. The outermost normal fault just results from the collapse of this wedge here, which is unsupported during the subsidence of this central block, because this goes down, so this has to collapse. And it collapses with these normal faults. So now you may wonder which is the reason to have these uh, reverse faults here. There is no compression, actually. It's just a matter of a differential vertical movement. So if you have this type of movement, this may be a caldera, the floor of a caldera which goes down, then the sigma 1 trajectories are not vertical, but they are arcuate. And so the result is that you need a fault at a low angle with these uh, sigma 1 trajectories, which must have this geometry and this kinematics. So you, have, you end up with a reverse fault, an outward dipping reverse fault, which has nothing to do with compression. So I guess volcanologists can relax about this problem. The only minor difference, I would say it's a minor difference for me, is the results from the thickness of your overburden. 
if you have a very thick roof overlying your magma chamber, your experimental magma chamber, then you just have a repetition of the same features you see with a thinner roof. So you have a first set of outward dipping reverse folds, and then when they meet, you develop another one, and then you may develop another one, and then outside, you have these normal folds. But you see, this is just a repetition of what you see here. So it's nothing new, actually. So of course, this is all very nice, and uh, it may be interesting, but which is the feedback from the field or from geophysical data? Are these structures realistic, or is it just something uh, maybe all the modelers have made, have made the, the wrong move together? Actually, if you go to the field, the problem is that before you make the models, you have a certain view. Then you make the models, you start to have ideas, and you start to look for those data on the field. And actually, you see that there is plenty of evidence for it, and people have usually neglected it for decades. So this is, for example, a sec well, it's a, this is the map view, and this is the section view of a pit crater somewhere in Nicaragua. And uh, this section exposes uh, the deeper part of this pit crater. And you can see that there, are, there is plenty of outward dipping reverse faults. And outside, we have some uh, subvertical or inward dipping normal fault, which is very similar to the experiment. Of course, this is a pit crater. It's not a caldera. But the collapse mechanism is absolutely the same. If you look at the seismicity distribution in some calderas, like, for example, a bowl, here is one edge of the caldera, here is the other edge. Or Pinatubo, like in 1991, this is the seismicity which was developed during the 1991 eruption. You see that the seismicity is focusing along these outward dipping faults. Here, the faults maybe are too deep. They were just meeting at the surface. So this may explain why the Pinatubo caldera actually is very, very narrow. But probably one of the most interesting uh, pieces of, e of evidence for, this, uh, for the presence of this type of structures also in nature is the Miyake-Jima uh, collapse in 2000. This is a geological map which is derived from uh, the picture I showed you before. You can see we have this, inward, this inner ring fault, the outer ring fault. And if we make a section according to the authors who studied this eruption, you can see that the, this inner ring fault is a, an outward dipping reverse fault, whereas the outermost ring fault here is an inward dipping ring fault. So this is very much consistent with what we see in the experiments. And it's not just uh, Miyagejima, but we have a very similar structures developed also during the other caldera collapses, which have been occurring on basaltic volcanoes in the last decade like in Dolomie or Reunion in 2007, or even Bardarbunga in Iceland in 2014. So at this point, we see that there is a, a consistency between what we see in the experiments and what is there in nature. So at this point, if this is true, we may try to make a further step. We can say, OK, let's try to see what we have at the surface, which is the structure of a caldera at the surface and try to extrapolate using the models, which may be the structure of the caldera at depth. So for example, if we have a down seg at the surface, we can see that there is a, a fault, which is a depth, which is propagating upward. And this doesn't have, doesn't have reached yet the surface of our uh, the surface yet. Or even if we see two pairs of uh, nested calderas, sorry, a pair of nested calderas, we can think that we have an outward dipping reverse fold and an inward dipping normal folds. So just looking at the structure at the surface, we can try to say something about the structural depth using the models. So in doing this here, we listed all the calderas, all the best known calderas, with their diameter, their amount of subsidence. And in particular, we assigned to each of these calderas here a stage, which corresponds to one of the four stages which we see in the experiments. So for example, Miyagejima is a stage four caldera because it develops the two ring faults. And if we plot all of this on a diagram, this is the subsidence and this is the diameter. And uh, you can have uh, different type of stages with the different colors. All of this may look uh, chaotic at the first glance, but actually 
if you help yourself with uh, some lines, which are, should be interpreted as broad transition zones, not sharp boundaries, you can see that usually below this line, we have a stage one calderas, down sex. Here we have stage two calderas. Here we mostly have stage three. And here we mostly have stage four. So this means that uh, despite, of course, some discrepancy, because nothing is ideal in nature, if you have a fixed diameter of a caldera, and you just increase the subsidence, so you pass from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four calderas which is exactly the same as we observed in our experiments. So this means that this apparent uh, randomic distribution of the structural calderas has an explanation based on our models, which is essentially, for a given diameter, a function of the amount of subsidence. So there is a continuum in these evolutionary stages, which is defined by the ratio between the diameter and the subsidence. So the lower is this ratio, the more evolved is the caldera. And actually, we may also try to go further, because uh, if we have this uh, diagram here, once we, once we have a certain amount of subsidence for a caldera with a given diameter, we just may try to infer its structure without even looking at the caldera. That's a bit extreme, of course, but it seems to work with, for example, with the Bardar Bunga caldera, which was uh, formed in 2014, and I guess that Thorsten will say something about this in the next hours. <coughs> but the Bunga had a collapse in the order of 65 meters. The width of the caldera is uh, 7 kilometers. And so this would place Bardar Bunga here, in the stage 1 calderas, in the downside calderas. And according to, the, to some models, they also interpreted the, the, the formation of the caldera as a downseg where the normal, oh, sorry, where the ring folds at depth, they didn't make it to the surface because the deformation was, uh, the subsidence was too low to develop the folds up to the surface. So at this point, you may also try to understand that we may use uh, these experiments as well as their comparison to nature for a, an updated classification of calderas which just not takes into account only the geometric features of the calderas, but it also takes into account the structure and mostly the development, the evolution of calderas. And this is just uh, using the amount of subsidence for a given diameter passing from stage one to stage four. The difference between this classification and the other is uh, almost like looking at uh, an image in one case and looking at the movie in the other case. So we may go back to Bolsena our Bolsena, and rather than saying, uh, well, Bolsena is a, what did I write here? A symmetrically collapsed piston type caldera with down segment and piecemeal rims. Actually, it's just an asymmetric stage three caldera because it fits somewhere here in the previous diagram. Then we can also use these models to try to understand something about the kinematics of collapse. And to do this, you can use this particle image velocimetry technique, which tracks the motions of, the, of your particles on the surface of the model and in section view. For example, this is a very high aspect ratio caldera. And what you do, you, you just, uh, there is a glass which passes through the diameter of this caldera. And you can track the motion of all the particles which are subsiding along this vertical line here from the surface to the depth. And you can track this motion from the surface to the depth as a function of time. And so you end up with different uh, amount of, uh, uh, well, different rate of, rates of collapse. So you can have some velocities. And you can distinguish different types of collapse, like a continuous collapse here, where the velocity is pretty much constant and is similar to the one which we, it's the same, actually, to the one which we impose at the base of our uh, of our uh, sand pack, because in this case, this is sand. But then you may develop at one point some sudden collapses where the velocity may increase up to four orders of magnitude, just keeping our source at a constant subsiding velocity. And then after this, over in, uh, a background of constant, quite constant uh, collapse, these dark blue areas, you have spikes of higher velocities, which give you an incremental collapse. 
And this occurs when you develop the ring faults and you have some friction along the, along the ring faults. And this incremental type of collapse is very much consistent with what we see in nature in the last, uh, the last collapses, for example, like at uh, Miyagejima again or Dolomier, using the tilt data, like this is Miyagejima and this is Piton de la Fournaise, or even the seismicity data. So this is interesting because in this case you may even be able, you have some more quantitative results and you may even be able to match your uh, experimental results with the geophysical data, which support in both cases an incremental collapse of calderas. So calderas usually do not collapse in a continuous way, but they collapse step by step. So now let's talk about the second problem, which is unrest. Unrest at calderas is a very important and delicate topic, and I don't know if you are aware about unrest, Unrest is a can occur at any volcano, and is a deviation from the baseline in the geophysical and geochemical indicators. So it's uh, usually highlighted by surface deformation, degassing, gravity changes, and uh, seismicity. This may be related to the activity of the magma chamber, or even if you are below calderas, you usually have an adothermal system, which, is, uh, which may also be active and may also complicate your understanding of uh, what's happening. The important point is that the unrest can be eruptive or not. This means that every eruption is always preceded by an unrest, but not all the unrest episodes culminate in an eruption. So unrest is a necessary but not sufficient condition to have an eruption. And the biggest challenge of volcanology is when you are in unrest, is to understand whether this will lead to an eruption or not. Okay, this is the challenge that volcanologists have to face, have to face in the next uh, decades. So this here yeah, is a cartoon which is just uh, simplifying things. This is a possible way to develop an arrest, to trigger an arrest, but it's not the only way, of course. In this case, you have the emplacement of some shallow magma. This is deforming the host rock, so you have seismicity, fracturing. The fracture may increase the permeability of the host rock, so you may have that the Magmatic gases go up and fill the endothermal system, which gets pressurized. In turn, this endothermal system may also uh, induce earthquakes and induce surface fracturing, with the net result to have degassing, surface deformation, and also seismicity at the surface. So there are different types of arrest. I'm going to show you just some very basic types, some reference type. This is from uh, Marco, actually. <laughs> you can tell this much better than me, actually. This is a typical unrest episode of a basaltic caldera. And uh, what you have here at the deformation on the top of our caldera is given by these red dots here. You have inflation, then you have the eruption, you have a sudden deflation, and then you continue with inflation. Then you have eruption, sudden deflation, and then inflation again. This is something which has been already shown by Paul and uh, Michael the, the second day. And I guess it's a very typical pattern of many basaltic calderas. There will be some complication which is related to the seismicity accompanying this, uh, this deformation. If the magmatic system is open, you will not see any seismicity, or you will see minor seismicity, because you really don't need to fracture the host rock. The conduit is open. If the conduit is closed, you will have uh, much more seismicity. So this may be some difference between in basaltic calderas. But the situation is much more complex in felsic calderas, silicic calderas. So this is an example from Campi Fregrei. You remember Campi Fregrei? And uh, you can see from the uh, surface deformation that since 19, well, the 50s, the early 50s, we have at least one, two, three, and four uplift episodes, four unrest episodes. And this one in particular in the early 80s has been uh, quite intense. You had two meters of uplift in two years with a lot of seismicity, strong seismicity, and also some important degassing. And then now the current unrest here is more subtle, well, at least the, the uplift is more subtle, gentler, and we only have uh, 30, 35 centimeters within the last 10 years. We have a minor seismicity, but we have a lot of magmatic degassing. So 
as you may understand, uh, the civil defense is very much worried about the possibility of an eruption at Camp Ifegrei today because of these fissures here. What do you think about this? Any idea? You may wonder, OK, there was nothing here, no eruption. When I had two meters of uplift, a hell of seismicity, why? so why should I worry now that we have just a few tens of centimeters of uplift and uh, no seismicity? So this may be something which tells you to relax, not to worry too much. Of course, this may be true, but if you look at Rabaul, what happened to Rabaul? Rabaul, exactly on the same years, in the early 80s, where we had the unrest at Camp Ifregrei, we also had an unrest at Rabaul with approximately one meter of uplift and then a very, very strong seismicity. Then after this, we had just, uh, well, a stable uh, ground level without, without so much deformation, very minor seismicity. And then after a decade, in the early 90s, we had some minor uplift 20, 30, 40 centimeters, no more than that, with some minor to moderate seismicity. And then, at this point, the caldera erupted. And it was a BI4 eruption, so it was not really a minor eruption. So this is quite, uh, I would say, nonlinear, because you, would, uh, you had a hell here, and nothing happened, and you just had a minor perturbation of your system here, and this was leading to an eruption. The possible explanation behind this is that you don't have to think about unrest episodes as separate entities. So you should look at the cumulative history of, uh, of the caldera here. So this unrest episode was probably priming the system, while this one was triggering. It was just a, so yeah, the magma chamber was really getting somehow, or the magma chamber, well, the intrusion was getting uh, to shallow levels. And so, yeah, you just had needed a small trigger to induce the eruption. So you may understand how important and how delicate it is to study the unrest processes at calderas. And uh, there has been this important, very important monography by Newell at Zurich, in, which was made in 1988 about unrest at calderas. It's a, it was a, it's a review about all the unrest processes which have been occurring before 1988. So we try to update this uh, unrest uh, episodes, the knowledge of unrest episodes after 1988. So we created a database with all the available data on unrest, instrumental unrest episodes after 1988. And we were able to identify 166 unrest episodes from 42 calderas which have been uh, quite well monitored in the last decades. Of course, this is a just a small part, well, not a small, it's a, it's a part of all the calderas, of the, all the active calderas which are around in the world, but uh, many of them are not monitored, so you really don't know whether there's been an arrest or not there in the last decades. You don't have any information. But the fact that in these 42 calderas, we were always able to see at least once and unrest in the last 25 years suggests that also the other calderas may have experienced some form of unrest. And this also suggests that the unrest may be the rule rather than the exception at calderas. And in this case, most of the unrest episodes were eruptive, and most of them occurred at uh, mephic calderas. So we try to to identify some types of caldera rest in a first qualitative approach, just considering the composition of the magmatic system, very roughly mafic or felsic, and then the amount of opening of the magmatic system. So plugged caldera means a caldera which doesn't degas. Semi-plugged is a caldera which degasses. And open caldera is a caldera which degasses and as an open conduit to the surface. So you see that these uh, mephic calderas, they're mostly characterized by eruptive arrest, as we saw before. So this means that there is a frequent release of magma through eruptions. And this may occur with a typical pattern you saw before. So inflation, eruption, sudden deflation, and again inflation. The only obvious difference being the presence of seismicity or not. So that in plug calderas, you don't expect, so you expect some seismicity whereas in open calderas you don't expect seismicity. The situation is more complex, as we have seen with felsic calderas. We have a more complex behavior, 
the release of magma through eruptions is much less uh, common. And in many cases, you have this hydrothermal system which is complicating your understanding of the caldera. It's complicating the signal. And sometimes it's buffering the signal, the, the magmatic signal. Sometimes it's uh, uh, amplifying it. We were able to define uh, two main behaviors. One is for plugged calderas, so non-degassing calderas. And usually, these are usually smaller. Actually, we have uh, very few examples of these type of calderas. Pinatubo may be the best example, even though there was not an evident caldera on Pinatubo before 1991. So Pinatubo is halfway between a stratovolcano and a caldera, I would say. In this case, we had isolated and rapid unrest episodes. Whereas in the other case, in the other category, which uh, includes most of the calderas, and these calderas are degassing calderas. They are usually larger, and they are continuously restless over decades, or in some cases, over, an, over centuries. And a nice feature, an interesting feature, is that these calderas are usually associated with resurgence. So this, uh, the relationship between all these features should be better investigated, also to understand the resurgence. Of course, all of this is very qualitative. So we tried uh, to do a quantitative analysis, so a statistical analysis of this data. And I guess this has been done with Laura Sandri. And uh, I guess this analysis is pretty much finished now. So I'm just going to anticipate some result very briefly in a very uh, short way. I guess um, one of the most interesting results is that the eruptive arrest is a shorter than the non-eruptive, or failed, if you like, unrest. So this means that if a magma is ready to erupt during an arrest, it will erupt soon. <coughs> And soon means uh, within uh, a very few months. It's these blue frequencies here. If we wait too much, the magma will probably not erupt. And in particular, in non-open calderas, so this means in calderas which are degassing or not degassing, so they don't have an open conduit, we see that this short eruptive unrest is always accompanied by high seismicity and degassing. And you may think this is uh, complicated, maybe not useful, but just think about Campi Fregate, the ongoing unrest episode. The ongoing unrest episode has been lasting for uh, years, maybe a decade, and it has just some minor seismicity. So if we should uh, use this data, and we want to really say something, so we can, uh, if nothing changes in the Y, we may expect that the caldera Campi Freire Caldera should not erupt in the next future, in the near future, because we don't have high seismicity and uh, the erupting arrest is much longer than the one which is uh, shown here to, uh, to erupt. Of course, this is a, a very simple, I would say, analysis, because it's just describing behaviors. But what we have to do is to understand the processes behind. So I guess this is an important, the first important step to have data to understand how things may work in nature. And then based on this, we can try to develop some model which is uh, trying to explain these observations, some physical model. So once you have an arrest, there is usually some magma ready, possibly ready to make it to the surface. So you may expect to have some magma transfer. So the next chapter, here we will talk about the transfer of magma within calderas. And you have seen on the other day the lectures of, uh, of Claude Jopard, and he was talking about loading of volcanoes. So loading the role of topography. Actually, with calderas, we have the same problem, but the opposite sign. We have the unloading, because we are removing mass, we are remo removing crust, and so we may expect to have some uh, some similar process, but with an opposite uh, behavior, I would say. And I guess that uh, we guess, actually, not only me, that this unloading may be very important in, in controlling the stress distribution within a volcano and ultimately to control the path of magma transfer. So as a, an example of unloading, I will show you two processes, two, two cases. In one case, we will consider a larger unloading which is given by a mafic caldera, like, like Fernandina. And in the other case, we will see a smaller unloading with a felsic, from a felsic caldera. 
Campi Flegrei. So Fernandina is uh, particularly interesting because uh, it's a quite a unique volcano because it develops these uh, circumferential fissures outside the caldera rim, and then, which are here, these blue, black ones, and then outside we have these radial fissures. And these fissures have been, uh, have been observed only at very few volcanoes, and these are mostly in the Galapagos Islands. So the problem is to understand this uh, complex uh, eruptive pattern. And we have to think that below each fissure there is a dike. So this means that we are talking about dike propagation, shallow dike propagation here. And there have been many models trying to explain this, but we believe that the most comprehensive model, which is uh, trying to explain all the observed fissures, is the one which takes loading into account. This is a study we have been doing with uh, Eleonora and Marco. And here we report, uh, these are results from a numerical model. This is the topography of the volcano along an axisymmetric section from the center of the caldera, outward. And uh, this is the topography again. Yeah, this is the caldera area. And here we are just considering the stress distribution which is related to the topography, to the topographic variations. And so these uh, dark lines, that's a sigma 1. And the gray lines here is the sigma 3. And you can see that below the caldera, you have just below, you have a subvertical sigma 3. Whereas if you move to the side, this is better showing this schematic diagram here. If you move to the side, you tend to have sub-horizontal sigma 3 distribution. So this suggests that below the caldera, you are promoting the emplacement of seals because sigma 3 is vertical. And then as far as you go to the side, you are promoting the emplacement of inclined sheets and then of subvertical dikes, which in three dimensions are circumferential dikes. Whereas if you are on the outer slope, you have these circles here, which means that you have an out of plane sigma 3. So you are promoting the emplacement of radial dikes. And this is pretty much consistent with what has been observed at least during the last two eruptions in Fernandina in 2005 and 2009. These are the imaged intrusions during these two eruptions. This is a seal and this is a dike. This is an inclined sheet, which is then twisting along a radial axis to become a radial dike towards the other part of the, of the edifice. So this is just to say how important it is to consider the unloading here, especially on the caldera, to explain this pattern of circumferential fissures here, and uh, the load of the volcano to explain the pattern of radial fissures outside. Yeah, so the idea is that caldera loading promotes seal here and the proximal concentric dikes, these ones here, whereas the load of the volcano promotes these radial dikes outside. So we may try to go further and put uh, Fernandina in a wider context, actually, reporting here the ratio between the length of all the circumferential fissures against that of the radial fissures. And here this unloading, sorry, this pressure ratio, where there is the unloading pressure and the dike oil pressure. So for example, Fernandina has a high unloading pressure because you have a, a deep and wide caldera. And you have a small dike over pressure because in this case you have some dense magma, then you have basaltic magma, and the magma chamber is uh, very shallow. So you, don't, you, you need relatively low pressures to inject the magma to the surface. On the opposite uh, side of the diagram, we have, for example, Toba or Campi Flegrei, where the topographic expression of the caldera is uh, lower, actually. It's not so evident, especially in Campi Flegrei. And you have a deeper chamber and a lighter felsic magma. So you have a different behavior here in this case. So this is just to say that uh, it may not be only the unloading, which is uh, somehow driving the presence of these uh, uh, circumferential uh, dikes outside the caldera rim, but it may also be uh, important to consider the depth of the magma chamber as well as the composition. For example, here, if we have lighter magma, felsic magma, I would expect this lighter magma to go straight up without really turning and twisting to the side of the, of the caldera. Now let's look at this uh, Campi Flegrei, which lies on the opposite side of the diagram. And to do this, I will show you uh, 
what uh, may have happened just before the last eruption at Campi Fregrain in 1538. Because the problem when you deal, for example, with a caldera which has not been erupting for a long time is that you really don't know how the magma may be transferred. You don't have any, any evidence. Maybe if you have an intrusion, you know that the magma is there, but you don't know how it may reach the surface. So if you are able to reconstruct the last uh, eruptive uh, event, which is the, the one which is nearmost to you, you may try to say something. And well, Campi Fregrei has a limited topographic expression because the topographic difference between the uppermost part and the bottom part, which is here in the sea, is in the order of a few hundreds of meters. So it's not very few, actually. So it's not like Fernandina. And uh, also, you have, but there is still some possible unloading, which is also related to the difference in density between the deposits the sedimentary deposits within the caldera and those outside the caldera. So you also have to take into account for the density difference. And so it may have some uh, unloading, but it's much limited, more limited than Fernandina. And the interesting point is that all the last unrest episodes I showed you before, they are culminating in this area, in Pozzuoli. So the maximum uplift is here. And uh, this... These arrest episodes have been interpreted to result from the pressurization of a magma chamber, which has this shape here in map view, this extent, this, vert, this green ellipse here, which is an oblate reservoir. And this has been uh, consistently responsible for all these uh, arrest episodes. And the nice thing is that if you look at uh, the resurgence, because we have a resurgence in Campi Fregrei, the resurgence is testified by this last start submarine terrace. So this was below sea level, and then it has been uplifted now. And the culmination of this terrace, again, is in Pozzuoli. So this suggests that the longer term uplift coincides with the shorter term uplift. Resurgence has been occurring in the last, well, at least this resurgence has been occurring in the last 5,000 years. So we can say that in the last 5,000 years, the system, the magmatic system, was probably there, and it has been controlling the shorter as well as the longer term uplift episodes. And uh, this is the limit of the uplifted area, the yellow ellipse, ellipse the limit of the uplifted area uh, of the resurgence. And this is Monte Nuovo. So that's where the eruption occurred in 1538. And, uh, there are some very recent geophysical and geological data which suggest that Monte Nuovo was fed by a dike, north-south trending dike, which is actually circumferential with regard to, this, uh, to the present magmatic reservoir. So what we did is to exploit the unique amount of information we have on Campi Fregrei, because we have several historical buildings and monuments along the coastline, these black points here, which have been uh, quite well monitored in the last 2,000 years, I would say, because there is a, a wealth of uh, historical, archaeological information, as well as, of course, geological, paleontological, and geodetic information, so that it's possible to reconstruct the apparent sea level variations in correspondence of each of these uh, benchmarks in the last 2,000 years. We have 20 benchmarks along the coastline. And uh, actually, it's not the sea which has been moving, because the sea has been pretty much stable in the last 2,000 years. So we have to think about the ground movement. So the coast was going up and down. And this is an example from Serapeo. Do you know Serapeo? That's an ancient Roman market, which was submerged until uh, the early 60s. And then after the latest uplift episodes, today is above sea level. And you can reconstruct from this and other monuments the ups and downs of the caldera in the last 2,000 years. And this is summarized in these diagrams. I will not go into the details. But the, the message, the summary, is that just, well, a few centuries before the eruption, so from 1251 to 1536, there was a strong uplift which was culminating again in the Pozzuoli area. 14 meters of uplift culminating here. So this was very similar to what we have seen on the short and on the longer term. But in the two years just before the eruption, the uplift was shifted here in the area of the future Monte Nuovo event. So the maximum uplift moved here. 
And of course, in this analysis, we try to remove any surface deformation which was related to the days immediately before the eruption, which may have been induced by the emplacement of the dike. So we did our best to do this. And uh, if we try to invert this deformation using these simple elastic models, we end up with two sources. One is uh, just south of Pozzuoli, and within one error, within some error, I would say that it's uh, very much consistent with the longer term source and also the shorter term source, which has been uh, inferred to lie below Pozzuoli. This is at four kilometers of depth. And then we have another source, an eccentric source, which is just below Monte Nuovo at a similar depth. Okay, this is the fit between the model and the data for the central source. This is the fit uh, for the eccentric source. And this is uh, the conceptual model behind. What we see is that uh, the magma has been accumulating within uh, the central magmatic system for centuries, just below the center of the caldera. And then at the last minute, two years before, it has been laterally transferred to an eccentric reservoir and from here, a dike, a circumferential dike, was propagated. So we have this lateral transfer of magma, which we may interpret to result from the unloading of the caldera, from the moderate unloading of the caldera, which is uh, inducing this uh, stress distribution, the one you saw before, from a vertical sigma tree below the caldera to an inclined sigma tree to the side, which is... Uh, inducing the lateral propagation of magma and then the vertical propagation of dikes. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, it's not only this eruption which may have followed this behavior. If we plot the location of all the vents in the last 5,000 years from the center of the caldera, radially outward, we see that these vents, they peak at three kilometers from the center of the caldera. So this shows that in the last 5,000 years, Despite the maximum uplift has been systematically occurring in the center of the caldera, magma was transferred laterally outside, immediately outside the most uplifted area. This is the limit of the resurgence. So just outside the, the resurgence and within the caldera falls. So this suggests that we had the, this mechanism we had during uh, the Monte Nuovo eruption may have been occurring also in the last 5,000 years. So it may have been a more general mechanism, which is uh, due to unloading, which is able to migrate the magma laterally, eventually erupting outside this most uplifted area. And it's not just Campi Fregrei, because if you start to look in the literature, also in this database of unrest episodes in the last 25 years, there are other arrest episodes which uh, share a similar behavior. For example, Rabaul, uh, there is Aso, there is uh, Okmok, and uh, also Toya. So this may be a more general mechanism which may apply to, to many calderas. So what we have seen is that uh, the role of unloading in calderas in two different cases. In one case, where we have a large unloading, we have a magma transfer outside the caldera rim. In the other case, where we have a smaller unloading, we have magma transfer within the caldera, but still outside the central part of the caldera. And this is interesting because uh, it's also important for uh, uh, hazard assessment, because if next time, if you see a large, a very large uplift in the center of a caldera, you don't have to expect necessarily to have the eruption there. The eruption may occur in a peripheral way, in a peripheral area. Of course, this is a very schematic uh, approach, I would say, because we may have a lot of complications. For example, regional tectonics, we have, we have some extension or compression. This will affect our uh, stress trajectories, so the dike path will be affected as well. And as I told you, also the composition and depth of the chamber should also be taken into account. So the final message about uh, this lecture is, uh, the first is the importance of the amount of subsidence for a fixed diameter of a caldera in uh, controlling the structure and the evolution of a caldera. Second is uh, the importance to understand uh, the unrest processes, which seem to depend uh, on the composition and opening of the system. And the challenge is to uh, try to understand in a physical way the observations we have from a statistical point of view. 
And finally, we have seen how unloading may play a different role in different types of calderas. That's it. Thank you very much.